Today on Sagittarian Matters, we have advice from resident Capricorns Jessica Lanyadu and Beth Pickens, plus unsolicited food reviews from my friend Don Riddle. Stay tuned. Sagittarian Matters, Sagittarian Matters, what's the Hi, Nicole Georges. This is Don Riddle. I'm calling you because I'm going to give you two vegan food reviews that you didn't ask for. One is uh, Icelandic Provisions Oat Milk, uh, not yogurt, it's Skyr, which is maybe Icelandic for yogurt, S-K-Y-R. I got the plain one uh, for free. I got these for free. And I want to review them because they're both pretty good. The yogurt is uh, beige and does not look good but the taste is very yogurty and sour and nice. The other item is a cashew and almond uh, dessert dip spread chocolate made by a company called Hope. It tastes like pudding and there's like crunches of something in there. I don't know what it is. I think nuts, I don't know. It's good. Uh, If someone offered these items to me for free again, um, I, w- I would gladly accept them. Hello from the Sagittarian Matters Social Distancing Studios in Los Angeles, California. Listeners, yuck, it's Father's Day. Yay, it's Pride Month. Wow, my apartment is 270 degrees. I'd love to tell you about a recent development, and that is that I've joined a new subculture. My air conditioner is broken. I'm not going to name any names, nor will I point fingers, but I will say that I left for a couple months, and when I came back, it didn't work anymore. There's something very small wrong with it. It's only a couple years old. I just got it in 2019. I don't use it that much. And so I thought, I'm going to try to fix it. Here's where the subculture comes in. Nobody fixes portable air conditioners. I have gone on a quest. I have posted on every neighborhood message board looking for a repair person. I have called many, many appliance places, repair people, and I have joined a community on QAura that rotates around retired appliance repairmen who just answer questions from people for free all day long. I've messaged with grizzly old men with beards. Uh, I've gotten mansplained. Random gentlemen have told me I should just read the manual. Thanks, guys. And uh, this is my new life. Should I pass away someday before this air conditioner is fixed? Not anytime soon. I'm just saying if I never get it fixed. Please bring it to my gravestone. Duct tape it there. And please tape a note to it that says, do not throw away. This is not punk damage. This is not something that I'm just trying to revive that needs to, you know, go the way of the dodos or the dinosaur. This is a nearly new machine that I just want to fix something very, very simple. I don't want to throw it away. It's full of coolant. It's a giant piece of plastic. What? It's going to become like a townhouse for the rats of Nim if I throw it away. I just, you know, please look forward to hearing me tell you when I actually get it fixed by hook or by crook. Listeners, what do we have to talk about on today's episode? So much. But I do just want you to know that it's about 400 degrees in here because I can't have AC on anyway because it will compromise the quality of this audio that I'm recording for you today on an iPhone. Okay, we were graced with an unsolicited food review by friend of the show, Don Riddle. Thank you, Don. I appreciated that. I enjoyed it. And please send me more. Listeners, Dawn Riddle is on Instagram. You can find her at Dawn Riddle, or she has something called Bad Boys Diner out of her house. Find her on Instagram, Bad Boys Diner. Dawn makes beautiful food out of her house, gives it to her friends for free, sets up appointments with people to come sit on tables outside of her home, and someday soon, she's going to make friend to the show Morgan and I the very best meal of our lives. Find her, follow her, and trade food tips. Apparently, she has invented a type of cake that never existed before, and I believe it. Dawn is the person who gave me a really delicious tahini tip, which was tahini, cocoa powder, maple syrup, salt, mixed together in a bowl as a dessert. I love it. 
Okay, here's my top 10. The top 10 things I've been enjoying or not enjoying the past couple of weeks. Number one, the television show Hacks with Jean Smart. Jean Smart is terrific. She outshines every person in her sphere. I really love Jean Smart. I actually don't think I've seen her since Designing Women. Is that possible? I liked Hacks and I like Jean Smart. Number two, the show The Comeback with Lisa Kudrow, seasons one and two. After season one, I hated Polly G, and I still do. It's been many, many years, well over a decade, and I still feel the same sense of hatred towards the character Polly G. And I think this made it so I never finished season two until rewatching it this year. And I have to say, I've never... I've never felt so good about a series finale. I've never felt like I was made whole by a season finale like I did the finale of the comeback. It's really beautiful. I really recommend it. Season one is hard to get through because it's uncomfortable, but it's that way by design. Just do it. I am very sad to tell you that I watched the entire series younger, younger about an old woman who poses as a young woman. And that's the whole plot of the show. And I watched every season as recommended to me by Craig, neighbor Craig, who helped me raise a squirrel. When I say old woman, she's 40 in her early 40s. She's approximately my age, going back into publishing, pretending to be 25. Do I think she looks 25? Not necessarily. Do I think I look 25? Not necessarily. Anyway, I watched this entire show. Um, At the season finale, series finale, everyone got what they needed. That felt good, but not as good as the comeback. Um, I'm also sorry to say that I am just neck deep in The Handmaid's Tale. It's one of those things like when you're waiting for a bus and at a certain point you've waited so long it's uncomfortable and you're like, I should just get in the car. But I've waited so long that I just want to see this through. That's how I feel about Handmaid's Tale. I didn't want to watch it. I listened to the book. I uh, I started watching it. I've watched too many hangings, too many fake hangings, too many traumatic things now to give up right when they've gotten out of Gilead. You know what I mean? No spoilers, but you know, somebody had to exit Gilead at some point. Anyway, I was very saddened to find out that there's another season coming up. I thought I was like seeing it through and this was the last season and there's still more to come. I do want you to know, fun fact, the Sagittarian Matters social distancing studios are right next door to where a handmade someone who plays a handmaid on the television show used to live for a summer. Uh, Unfortunately, this handmaid was run over by a CGI train this year, but all the same, you know, praise be. Something I really enjoyed was the audiobook Rememberings by Sinead O'Connor as read by Sinead O'Connor as an audiobook. Um, For those of you who don't remember, she rose to fame. She had the number one song in the whole wide world. And then she did a protest. She ripped up a picture of the Pope on SNL to protest the child abuse that the Catholic Church was turning its back on. In this day and age, that's not the most scandalous thing in the world. There's dialogue around that. That's actually, you know, an issue that people talk about. But at the time, people just felt like she was the devil. She was sacrilegious. And somehow that made it open season for men of the world for everyone in the world to treat her terribly. She became a pariah. People made fun of her. People were threatening violence against her, encouraging others to do violence against her. They were having huge protests, just like when the Dixie Chicks said that they weren't proud of Bush and everyone like steamrolled their CDs or had a pyre. It was like that. It was like people were burning effigies of Sinead O'Connor and it was open season to make fun of her for the rest of time. This had an effect on her. And later in life, she suffered from a lot of mental illness and people were able to continue to sort of abuse her by just writing her off as quote unquote crazy. But the power of this book is that she's actually taking her narrative back, telling her story in her own words. She has stories about being a punk and so shaving her head when the record label record label wanted her to look like a sexy, feminine, long-haired songstress wearing tons of jewelry. She has stories about disliking Prince, about Peter Gabriel, about Bob Dylan, and about the men who never stuck up for her. And it's her telling the whole thing from her own side. I really loved it. I think she's very compelling. I think that she does a beautiful job narrating her own childhood story and her childhood trauma. And this is an audiobook that is great for a drive. 
in my opinion. The last thing I want to tell you about this week is kelp noodle salad. Have we talked about it before? It's the dog days of summer, and what is better than a crispy, crunchy little noodle, or maybe not crispy, but a crunchy little noodle with a little bit of bite in a salad? Anything to jazz up a salad. Anything to involve a little bit of noodle sauce delivery service to your greens. Here's the two ways that I dress it, one or the other, not both at the same time, please. Either a pesto or a tahini sauce. Pesto could not be easier. Come on. Today, I didn't have basil. I had arugula. I got a little fucked up from being in the back of the fridge. I had arugula. I had vile life Parmesan cheese. I had garlic. I had a nice olive oil, a little bit of lemon from a neighbor's tree. Throw some Maldon salt in there. Maybe some pepper for fun. Blend it up in the magic bullet. It took like three minutes and that was a beautiful dressing. The hallmark I feel of aging is referring to food as beautiful. It was a beautiful dressing to go on some little crunchy noodles that went atop more arugula. Is that kosher? I'm not sure. Having arugula sauce on top of arugula? I don't know. Um, And then some tofu on top. It was lovely with some carrot shreds, some more pepper, some hot sauce. Call it a day. Listeners, you already know my tahini, my tahini sauce that I like. Tahini soy sauce. If you're lucky, a little bit of ginger and garlic. If you are very lucky, some kind of fun hot sauce like sambal or sriracha. Uh, Some rice vinegar or lime juice. Blend it up. See how it is. If you need to add something sweet to it, like a dash of maple syrup, you could. Some sesame oil. Wonderful. Have that on your kelp noodles with some carrot shreds. Have it with some green onions. Have it with some sesame tofu. What a delight. I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you for listening. Please send us your advice questions, 971-361-9998-998-971-361-9998. Or find us on Instagram, at Sagittarian Matters. Send us a DM with your question. We will keep you anonymous. If you want to make up your own name, you can. Otherwise, I'll do it for you. And if you call our hotline, I promise not to answer the phone ever. Have a wonderful week. Please enjoy advice from Beth Pickens and Jessica Onyadu, Capricorns both. And next episode, we will have a full-length Beth Pickens radio hour. Have a great week. Happy Pride. Happy Father's Day. Happy Dog Days of Summer. Dear Sagittarian Matters, my question for you has to do with rejection. I graduated from my fiction MFA three years ago. A lot of cool things have happened in my life and career since then. I do creative work full time, which is never something I imagined for myself. I've also been rejected from every single fiction, fellowship, and residency I've applied to. I recently made the decision to stop applying altogether because the rejections make me feel discouraged insecure, and generally shitty about myself and my work. I have an agent and other avenues to make my short story and novel writing dreams come true. Still, there's a part of me that wants to keep applying and is really, really fixated. Really, really fixated on this narrow marker of success. There's one fellowship in particular that's become a white whale for me. When I was rejected for the third time this spring, I couldn't work on my novel for a month. Do you think I'm making the right choice for me, or should I shoot my shot for the fourth year in a row? Signed, Rejected in Reno. Hello, Rejected in Reno. Oh, great question. This is such a such a wonderful question. I'm so glad you asked this because this affects so many artists and writers. Rejection and getting uh, a new kind of relationship to it. So the short answer is, yes, I want you to keep applying for everything that you want and and are eligible for. Okay, so let me explain what that means. First, I want you to think about the residencies, the grants, the fellowships, the things that you really want in your life and career. Not that you think you should have, or if you got it, maybe you'd do it, but the things you want. Because I don't want you to just spend all your time applying to things. That can take up a lot of time, and you've limited time for this part of your career. Then I want you to make sure that you're competitive and eligible. 
That means first, make sure always with any application that you're absolutely eligible. Then I want you to see, is this a good time in your career to apply? Are you competitive? Meaning the people who are getting the things that you want, are they more or less your peers? Or are they people who are much further ahead in their career? For example, with my clients, I always recommend they don't start applying to a Guggenheim application. Um, to the Guggenheim Fellowship until they're at least in their mid 30s, because the Guggenheim presupposes that you have that you're a professional and you've been in your career for at least you know 15 years. So it wouldn't be a right time to apply in one's late 20s. So I want you to make sure that the people who are getting the things you want are more or less your peers, even if you don't know them. Are they in the same sort of phase of, of career? Okay. Next, I want you to start to begin to change your relationship to rejection. Because if you can make friends with rejection and make it a goal to go after a certain number of rejections a year, you can begin to detach from the effects of rejection. Pause for the fire truck. Hopefully that's it. Um, Which is really important because being a a part of a writer's life is getting a lot of rejection, right? It's like trying to sell a book and not and getting no after no after no with different publishers, applying to teaching jobs, maybe trying to get stories placed, Um, all kinds of applications. You're going to get rejected a lot. That is part of being a professional artist. So changing your relationship to it so that it doesn't take you out for a month is really worth your time. And it's totally possible to do. There is an apocryphal story, I believe it's apocryphal, about the feminist artist, the late feminist artist, Carol Lee Schneeman, and that she applied for the Guggenheim Fellowship 16 times, and she got it on the 17th. And I like that story and other stories of people applying over and over and over again to the things they want and being unwilling to give up as, you know, a source of inspiration. What you don't get has nothing to do with you. When you get rejected, it has nothing to do with you and it has more to do with the cohort that the panel selected. And the thing with panels on any kind of grant or fellowship or anything at all They're a group of bozos. And I say this lovingly. I serve on panels too. I'm another bozo. It's just a group of strangers who come together and have to make really difficult decisions on that day to pick a group of artists who cannot be compared. You can't compare one writer to another. And yet that's what the panel must do. And then the next day, that group of bozos, they might have picked slightly different people. But here's the thing. One time, it's going to be your group of bozos, the people who see your application and they say, yes, we want this person. So your task as the applicant is to make sure that your strong application is there, that your hat is in the ring when your group of bozos is making decisions. And I want you to go into it with a little bit of a plan of detachment, of um, you're doing your part by putting your applications in the world. Oh, I know, the other thing I really wanna say too, I should have said this at the top, If you're not already doing this, make sure you show your application materials from time to time to some trusted advisors who also do a lot of applying to things. Because it is useful to make sure that your application reads well, meaning it's very clear, they understand what you say you want to do, it sounds feasible. Sometimes artists, including writers, um, don't write very strong applications because it's, it's a different kind of writing. I mean, I worked as a grant writer for over 10 years. It's a different kind of writing. And I had all kinds of clients, including writers who that wasn't their strong suit, writing their own grants. And so they hired me to do it. And maybe your applications are fine, but it's worth passing them in front of a few trusted advisors' eyes, people who know about application materials, just to make sure it's really clear. So keep applying, get some feedback to make sure your applications are strong, apply for things you want and apply for things that you are competitive for and learn to go after rejections and make friends with it. It's a different group of bozos every time. Good luck. Today's episode is brought to you by Maria Turner Carney, Emily Helmes, Shoshana Ruth Wechter, Christy Herod, and Joey Soloway. If you would like to support Sagittarian Matters, in particular, producer Chris Sutton, please send $5, $5 million, that's your business, via PayPal to hornetleg at gmail.com. Or, this just in, he's got a Venmo, Hell Books on Venmo. That's H-E, double hockey sticks, books. 
Thank you for your support, and we look forward to saying your name on the podcast. Producer Ponyo looks forward to it too. Don't be scared, that's just Ponyo's speaking voice. Jessica Lanyado is an internationally respected astrologer and psychic medium who has been in private practice with clients all over the world since 1995. You may recognize her from her very special guest appearance on Relative Fiction. Jessica is a triple Capricorn. She has a wonderful podcast called Ghost of a Podcast, and her book, Astrology for Real Relationships, is available right now. Find it at lovelanyado.com or anywhere books are sold. Well, I come to you from the Sagittarian Matters social distancing studios in Los Angeles, which in this subletted home is a crib. This is a crib that the people whose home I'm subletting, their toddler child usually sleeps in. But I have found that for podcasting, this is the room in the house with the best audio. So I record, I've been recording everything from this crib. So are you like sitting inside of a crib? Yes. These are the bars of a crib around me. Um, One side is open because it's a big girl bed, but uh, I'm surrounded by boxes and stuff. Anyway, we have a lot. We have a lot, a lot of questions from listeners who are so excited to have you back on the show, as am I. As am I. Okay. Dear Jessica and Sagittarian Matters. In a world where direct communication is often taken as rude or threatening, How do we honor our honest, truthful nature without either shrinking to avoid hurt feelings or being harsh? That's interesting. Um, Wondering in Wisconsin. Wondering in Wisconsin. That's also just good. I don't know if they really are in Wisconsin. I would be really charmed if they weren't and I just used it because it it was like a good woo. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I, I mean, I, this is interesting too, because I, it's almost like a, there's like a certain East coastness and a certain yeah. West coastness. Yeah. Do I don't think? find, I mean, for, it's interesting because yes, some people feel that directness is rude or is that what the words they used? Yes. Mm-hmm. And this person appears to be uh, on the spectrum of woman identified mm-hmm. more. Tw- mm-hmm. And so people are less, people Absolutely. are less accustomed to directness from women or people that present feminine, mm-hmm. um, they're like, oh, what are you doing? You know, it's interesting. I'm very direct. You're a very direct person as well, eh? So for me, I, I am a very direct, very honest. And I made a decision. I know this might sound so silly, but I personally made a decision when I was a teenager. I was like, I'm just going to be a really honest person. And what I found is that people, once they accept that you are how you are, they orient around that. But here's the big, but is that a lot of times we say to ourselves, I'm being honest, I'm being direct when what we're actually being is obnoxious or insensitive or demanding or critical. And there is a space between being honest and direct in those things. And I think some of that is about really making sure that what you're saying is considerate you know, and that's not, it's like, we couldn't answer this completely on, like, we don't really know what's going on with the questioner, but I think, I think that there's like two parts. There's one is if you're just being direct and honest and people are just like, ow, you're just supposed to agree with me, then let them have their reactions. Cause that's about them and not about you. You don't need to adjust something. That's someone else's problem. If that's someone else's problem, let them have their problem. And on the other hand, If you're telling yourself you're just being honest when you're actually kind of being a dick and not being uh, generous or empathetic, not considering how you frame your message or whether or not the person, you know, is in the right frame of mind to hear it or whether or not it's even your fucking place, then that's a different conversation, right? And it's hard to know which is which which based on this question. Yeah. I have a couple of things that I run through in my head sometimes, especially if I'm feeling a little elevated and I want to say something, which is, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? And does it need to be said? Does it need to be said right now? And does it need to be said by me? That kind of helps me like remember my place 
you know, and it's one thing if you're talking about in the workplace, but it's another thing if it's interpersonal, sometimes somebody doesn't need your fucking opinion. Yes. Sometimes someone wants to tell you something because they're your friend or your partner and they just want you to listen to them and reflect back that you hear them, not be like, well, I'm being honest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just want to tell you I'm being honest. I think, you know, so it just, it really, it really depends, but I do try yeah. to run through those things and they do help me hold my tongue at times where it's actually like none of my business Yeah. to tell somebody something that's my opinion of their life that they didn't ask for. I think that's so important. And also it's not being asking someone like, do you want to hear my, my thoughts right now? Or do you just want me to listen is a really easy, simple thing that you can do that can radically change your dynamics with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm looking more at this question. How do you honor your honest, truthful nature without shrinking to avoid hurt feelings or being harsh? Yeah. I feel like I feel we nailed like we, that. I mean, I feel like we, I feel nailed, like we it. nailed it. I also feel like, feel like um, those questions, those answers, wait, they're questions you ask yourself. I feel like mm-hmm. that should be turned into some sort of shareable post to help the people help themselves. Yeah. Well, I, I do have these as anonymous fuzzballs. I can post them to go I along. Think you with should. I really think you should because anonymous fuzzballs check, adore, love. And also just, I mean, if they're sharing wisdom, what's not to like? What's not to like? I mean, uh-huh. but it, it is, it is helpful sometimes when I have that feed, like sometimes like a pause, just a pause within myself to be like the thing I want to say that feels really true. Does it need to be their truth too? Or can it just be my truth? And another thing I think sometimes like, would it, would it fucking kill me if they didn't understand? Like maybe yeah. somebody doesn't understand your exact point of view. Maybe you just got to leave it there. Yeah. Dear Jessica and Nicole, how would you respond to a coworker who's a bully? Would you avoid, react from bullied in Bethesda? Bethesda? Where's that? Uh, Maryland. Oh, you're doing a great job with these, like, uh, what are they, they're called something, right? When they're like, bitty, bitty boobs. I don't know what they're called, but I really like these sign offs. Sign offs are amazing. Damn, that's kind of a tough question. What what is the context of the bullying? And is this coworker someone who has power over you or you have power over? Mm. Um I mean there's always profession. I mean there's a couple of things. There's one you could just quit taking it personally and just understand this person, the way that that you feel about them is probably the way a lot of people feel about them and you don't have to take it personally. And the more you can kind of detach from what they're doing, probably the more sane you can be. And you you don't have to sit there and be like, God damn it. Why did they say that thing? I mean, another thing is you could just, you could just say like, why, why would you say that? Or what are you, what are you saying? What? Or you could just report them to HR. I don't know. I'm kind of a tattletale. I'm kind of a tattletale and I don't, I don't always do it, but sometimes my instinct is like, don't tattle on that person. They're not acting right. I, I, I'm a fan of tattling too. In that kind of scenario. I also think it's possible that the person that they think is a bully is actually like wordless in Wisconsin. Wait, what was her name again? Yeah. Oh, uh, wondering in Wisconsin, wondering in Wisconsin, maybe wondering in Wisconsin. It's just like, I'm just trying to be direct and honest. And this person feels bullied. So there's also a question of like, kind of what you were saying of just saying directly, Hey, this is actually not funny to me. You need to fucking stop. And I think mm. we undervalue kind of the, the impact that being really direct and clear is. And I don't mean defensive and aggressive. I just mean firm and clear. And sometimes a lot of drama can be avoided by just saying, hey, eye contact. Are you having a bad day? Because the way you're treating me makes me feel bad and I'm not okay with it. You need to stop. And, you know, just not even like not trying to have a deep conversation, not trying to punish them, not trying to show them how sad you are, or how angry you are, just being like, this is my boundary. And if you are going to tattle, which I really like it that we're calling it tattling instead of reporting it. (laughs) um, But I think you have a stronger case if you have been kind of as quote, unemotionally as possible um, or professionally as possible, very exceptionally clear. And if you're at all concerned and you have a kind of a work environment that involves emails and computers, I'm a huge fan of a paper trail. So everything, everything, everything in writing, writing an email to someone saying, 
Hey, you were, you said this thing to me the other day. It made me feel really uncomfortable. I've noticed that this is a pattern. I'd like to bring it to your attention and ask you to stop. And then if there, this does go to HR, you have this really clear thing you can show to them. And it's, you know, it's always, it's always good to be a little litigious if you think something can go sideways on you. Yeah. I like the idea of a paper trail. I mean, even if you need to just make a note of it, send it to yourself or, you know, so you have a timestamp on it before you decide to make your next move. Um, I mean, I like what you said about being direct and also, you know, I'm, I'm not above making myself just seem like a knob who doesn't understand jokes and just being like, what, I don't, what do you, I don't understand why you said that. Or Hey, you said, you said that, are you doing okay? Because you said this joke and it really hurt my feelings. I just want to make sure everything's okay with you. Just making yourself just be like, you're dense. You don't understand that it was the funniest joke in the world. And you're just never going to, cause you just don't have a sense of humor. Mm-hmm. Just pretend like you don't have a sense of humor when you go to the office. So when they say something passive aggressive at your expense, you could just be like, what, what, is, what do you say? What are you talking about? And it just becomes significantly less fun if they have to explain their own mean joke. Yes. <laughs> but again, you know, I think some of, some of our feedback is like based on some assumptions about a, the work environment and b the, the nature of the bullying. Yeah. I'm assuming it's not that bad since there were no examples shared. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was, this was on Instagram stories, but they didn't make it like a multi-story thing. Which or- people do when things are really drama nuts. So, yeah. you know, speaking of drama nuts, I just got something called soap nuts. Have What's you heard that? of this? I can't remember. It sounds so- familiar. Soap nuts are these little berry nuts and you put them in a little mullen sack and you, you use them instead of laundry detergent. What? Yes. They're soap berries. If you do jaw soap berries or soap nuts, uh, you will find, I just learned about this and I am about to start trying it today. Put some essential oils on my soap nuts. You throw yeah. it in the wash. You can use soap nuts for your body, for your dishes or for your laundry. And they're literally just berries. So there's no packaging. There's like no harm to the planet. And apparently they work. We'll find out. This is wild. I mean, please, please report back. Oh, I will. And, um, I'm sorry that we took it away from bullying, but I feel like soap nuts are on topic for everything. They sure are. And you know, if you're getting bullied about the way your clothes smell, try soap nuts. (laughs) Try soap nuts. What if we found out that the bullying was this person like putting them in a locker, giving them a swirly, giving them a, like a like a noogie or like a rope burn or just like a wedgie? Then we've given them really bad advice. And I <laughs> am not could, above admitting that. The email could say, you know, when you gave me a wedgie this week, yes. it was very uncomfortable for me. I need to ask you to please stop giving me a wedgie. Honestly, I feel like you need to make a fuzzy about that. Please. Well, and also... Pulling someone aside is nice and awkward enough that you might get a response. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. As opposed but it comes to saying, back to being direct, doesn't it? So mm-hmm. I'm starting to really think that I know Wisconsin and Maryland are two different places, but I think this might be coworkers. Oh my God. Here's another one about work. Too bad we both work for ourselves. And we have forever. Dear Jessica and Sagittarius Matters, how do you handle passive aggressive colleagues who deliberately undermine you? From undermined in Utah. Direct. The con- the way to combat passive aggression is by being direct. And this, I mean, I had such a quick answer to it because I really, really believe that passive aggression is what people do when they're resentful. They feel powerless and they're harboring a lot of like pent up emotions and being direct is the most effective way of dealing with it because they will either explode and do something ridiculous or they will stop because they don't want to be called out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's important to also just try, you know, a way to like detach from this and not take it personally. It's just like this person's suffering. Maybe they're deeply insecure. They don't understand how to just like stay in their own lane and do their own work. So they have to, like, it's just been like, that person is suffering and I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to show up for my own work. I'm going to show up for me, do the best I can have a normal attitude, not let this infect my attitude, not let this infect my work as much as I can. And yes, alongside being direct or alongside tattling or, you know, but just (laughs) just like making your intention for yourself before you go into work, everybody like what, what can, what's in my control today is showing up and doing my best work and doing my best job and being pleasant for everyone to be around. What's not in my control 
how this dickhead acts. I, yes. It's in my control to have a conversation with them. What happens after that's out of my hands. So all I can do is like try not to be someone who's like stressed out and maniacal and mistrustful in the office because I don't think that's going to bode well for me in the future. Yeah. And was there something in the question remind me about them like wanting to undermine you? Undermining. And I think that undermining piece does require action. And the question for you to consider is, is this person trying to undermine you in a way where everyone in the room can see it? Or is it effective? Like, are they actually effectively undermining you? Because they would take different remediations, you know, because if somebody's being a dick, I mean, we've all been in a room where one person's just being a dick for no reason and everyone can tell in that scenario, you have different recourse than if they're actually like doing a very good job of undermining you. Right. And I think that because we don't really have that kind of data and we don't know what kind of work it is again, you know, I think it's kind of hard to speak to, but I think that is an important detail, right? Like you can call on allies, not asking people to take a side because that's not fair to do to people at work, even if they're your friends, but to be like, Hey, are you seeing this? Like, do you have recommendations on how you think I should handle it as, so it's like, I respect your opinion and you're in the room with me. Do you have advice you know, that you could pass on to me. So you're kind of um, not asking people to be emotionally responsible or to put their necks out in a way that's uncomfortable, but asking them to, uh, you know, to, to fucking be an adult in the room, basically, which I think is, you know, maybe won't be that effective or could be meaningfully effective. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, some of these things I can't, you know, it's again, it's a hard to tell from such a short question, but how important is it? Is it something that's just getting under your skin and is annoying you? Or is it something that's affecting the long arc of your career? Yeah. If it's just something like today that you're like, dang it, let it sit for a second. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dear Jessica and Sagittarian Matters, how do I get across that my unsolicited advice is really just my cancer moon over caring? <laughs> You're not going to like my answer. Carrying cancer in Calgary. <laughs> okay. This is ridiculous. I am so impressed. Carrying cancer in Calgary. That's so good. Thank you. CCC. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's not, that's not a good excuse. Sorry. That doesn't work. If somebody's telling you that you're giving too much advice and you're saying, oh, well, that's how I love you. Then you're not really loving them. Unfortunately, love is not, it's not enough to love someone. It's not enough to like someone or want the best for someone. You have to listen to what they're telling you feels like love and feels like care. And if every time, and you know, it's great for me to say this because I, I, I do pick on my partner who I love deeply, but I'd love to tell him how he could be better, you know? Um, and it doesn't feel like love to him half the time, other half the time it does. And that's actually on me to be a better person person, right? So I have a Capricorn moon I'm sharing that said, if people feel bullied or like they're getting unsolicited advice, then it's on you to say, Hey, my love language is giving advice. Are you open to advice right now? Or do you want me to take note of it and return to it at a better time? And if they say, don't give me your fucking advice, then you can say, okay, you know, <laughs> and just shut up. Shutting up is, is love sometimes, even I mean, if you're right and they're wrong. To me, sometimes I find myself giving unsolicited advice because someone else's discomfort is uncomfortable for me. Oh yeah. And sometimes people are just asking you to sit with that with them and give them the dignity of their own experience and of their own ability to know what to do next. Yep. And it's hard when we know so much and we care so much and we don't want them to be uncomfortable. We don't want to see them in pain. So we're like, I have 15 different ex- ideas of how you cannot be in pain anymore. But you know, like we said before, sometimes, and like Jessica said, sometimes Loving someone can just be listening to them. And that's all you have to do Yeah, is let them know. And also if you have enough self-awareness to know, okay, I've got a moon in cancer and that is why I behave in this way. Can you accept that someone else has a different birth chart than you and that that doesn't work for them? Asserting. So when we first learn astrology, it's very tempting. And I guess some people do it even when they're not at the beginning of learning astrology, but it's very tempting to be like, well, I can justify my behavior based on my birth chart. But if you live in a society and you have relationships with people, then when you force your birth chart down other people and their birth charts throats, then you're misusing astrology. You're not using it responsibly. It's about having the self-awareness to know, oh, my impulse is because maybe because I have a cancer moon or whatever it is. Although giving advice is not exactly a lunar thing, but my, my impulses, my, my desire to do these things is because of my birth chart. But, but 
the people that I'm choosing to be close to the people I care about are telling me that doesn't feel good. So what do I need to do to adjust? What are other ways I can show love? And can I accept that this person is different than me (laughs) and I need to care for those differences? It's, it's really important. And I don't think the answer is study the birth chart of the people you're close to so that you can figure out what they want. When someone tells you, stop stepping on my toes, just stop stepping on their toes. Don't look up their birth chart. Just stop stepping on their toes and don't look at your birth chart to be like, well, you know what? I'm stepping on your toes because I have a moon and whatever. Like if you're stepping on someone's toes, stop and do whatever investigations you need to, but don't use your chart to justify cultivating harm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you tell me what, what does it feel like or mean to you to have a Capricorn moon, which I also have. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's the hallmark of a hard woman. Yes. Well, it's one of the many hallmarks moon. The moon is least comfortable in the Zodiac sign of Capricorn. It's most comfortable actually in the Zodiac sign of the moon of, of cancer, but that doesn't mean it's healthier or less healthy. Just why when you think of the moon, right? It's, it governs the tides. It rules over water and Capricorn is all about structure and form. And so what we like to do is we like to have that water moon and Capricorn people take a specific shape. We put it in a container and we have it take a specific shape. So how do you maintain that? You either freeze it or you don't move around a lot. In other words, Mm -hmm. you keep control. You like to maintain control in order to create a sense of safety. And that is why moon and Capricorn can be, what were the words you just used? They were good. A hard woman, a hard woman. Um, that can be why, uh, the moon and Capricorn is associated with being hard, um, or unsympathetic, but on the positive moon and Capricorn people prioritize cultivating maturity Capricorn of the emotions, the moon. So the capacity there is to learn to cultivate emotional maturity through lived experience. Um, that's the, that's the, to my perspective, one of the greater potentials of the moon in Capricorn, the moon in cancer kind of conversely for CCC is, um, is really about being willing and able to cultivate the ability to be present with things as they ebb and flow, right? In the, in the, the fullness of emotionality. So in the context of this specific question, this lived experience is being present with other people don't always receive the gift you're giving them as a gift. So what do you do? You ebb, not ebb your love, not ebb your self-care, but you ebb the action so that there's greater flow in your life. And that there's no downside to it, but again, it's a practice. It's a practice. Sagittarian Matters is produced by Chris Sutton with assistance by Ponyo Georges. Our theme music is composed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs of the band Bouquet. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.